This is a lithium ion cell, and this is a supercapacitor. Both store energy using different methods, and a lithium ion cell can store about 35 times the energy of the capacitor, but takes around 45 minutes to safely charge, whereas the supercapacitor can be charged in under a minute. Though supercapacitors have several limitations. For a start, their lack of energy storage means they probably won't achieve much range in an electric vehicle. But also, making use of this energy storage is more complex than a lithium battery due to discharge rates. With a combustion engine car, the amount of power that the engine outputs doesn't depend on how much fuel is in the tank. The engine will still run at max power even if it's running on vapours. But with an electric car, the amount of power that the motor outputs depends on the voltage of the battery. So with a fully charged battery, you will have more motor power than with a discharged battery. However, this is nothing in comparison to supercapacitors. <laughs> this graph shows how the voltage of a lithium battery changes as it discharges. You can see it holds the voltage relatively constant until the last few percent where it decreases rapidly. Whereas a supercapacitor discharge rate looks like this. So if you try to run a regular electric vehicle, which is designed for this voltage range on supercapacitors, you can see there will be some issues. Mostly the fact it will only be able to use this amount of energy. So I'm going to build an electric bike that's specifically designed for supercapacitors. I started by CNC cutting an aluminium plate, which will fit inside my bike frame and carry out the role of a motor mount. I then cut an eight legged starfish shape, which will hold the coils for the motor. That's right, I'm building my own electric bike motor. The next step was to cut the rotor of the motor, which will be the spinning part, and also hold all of the magnets, which were glued into the rotor using epoxy, and were orientated in alternating positions. So one magnet had its north pole facing up, and the next magnet had its south pole facing up, and so on. Whilst the glue was drying, I started making the coils out of this 0.8mm enamelled copper wire which will be wound around this 3D printed core using this aluminium template with a 3D printed insert to protect the copper wire. I could then fix the template to a solid mount and start winding the coil. And yes, I'm using my calculator with its answer plus one feature to count the number of coils, which I need 150 of. And trust me, it's not fun losing count. After 150 turns of the copper wire, I secured the wire with some glue and can remove it from the template. Then to make sure it doesn't unwind into a nightmare spaghetti monster, I added some more glue to secure it all in position. Then remove the safety wire and we now have a motor coil. But how do we get this coil to spin the motor? If we connect the coil directly to a supercapacitor, it will create a current in the coil which will generate a magnetic field. And depending on the polarity of this magnetic field, it will attract one of the magnets, rotating the motor slightly. But to rotate the motor any further, the current direction in the coil must be changed by swapping the connections. This will then attract the next magnet and must be switched 16 times per rotation of the motor, which obviously can't be done manually. So we need to make a motor controller. The motor controller consists of a few different components, but it's essentially a bunch of electronic switches that convert a direct current from the supercapacitors into an alternating current for the coil. My original plan was to build my own motor controller as you can see here, but I managed to order the wrong components for the job, so it kind of worked for a few minutes before it gave up. I then found one of these brushed motor controllers which can switch the direction of a DC motor, and realised I could hack this to produce an alternating current for my coil. Unfortunately this motor controller isn't capable of regenerative braking, but it should be able to power my bike with some help from an external control board and some custom code. When riding a bike, you've probably never considered the timing of when you press down on your pedals. Your brain just naturally knows to apply pressure when your foot is at the top and past the center line. If you had no reference to where your foot was, you would end up applying pressure at the wrong position, causing the pedals to either spin backwards or not spin at all. This is exactly what the motor controller must deal with, as it currently has no method of detecting the position of the magnets and therefore applying random current directions to the coil won't get us anywhere. So to tell the motor controller when to apply power to the coil, I mounted a bunch of small alternating magnets to the rotor and mounted a magnetic sensor to the motor mount. So when the motor spins, the sensor will output either a one or a zero depending on the polarity of the nearest small magnet. This is like your brain detecting that your right leg is at the top, so stop applying pressure to the left pedal and start applying pressure to the right pedal. Then as your left leg gets to the top, stop applying pressure through the right pedal and start applying it through the left, and so on. 
So to start the motor, I push down on this lever throttle and a signal is sent to this electronics board, which holds the motor control code that I've written. This then reads a signal from the motor sensor and determines which direction to apply the current to the coil. It then sends that information to the motor controller to apply current to the coil and hopefully switches the current every time a new magnet passes. And now we have a completely DIY electric bike motor and controller. Now, because this motor probably won't have much torque, I made a huge sprocket for the rear wheel to give it some mechanical advantage. And when I went to fit the chain, I realized a major design flaw with this motor. Yep, the chain sticks to the motor magnets. But fortunately, it doesn't take much tension to keep the two apart. It's finally time to assemble the super capacitor bank that will power this bike which I chose to use these 2.7 volt 400 farad supercapacitors. Yes, you heard that right, these are 400 farad capacitors. And when soldered in series, should store 11,881 joules of energy, which sounds like a lot, but is roughly the same as an AA battery. But let me see you charge your AA battery in two minutes. Actually, don't do that. I hold no responsibility for fires caused by rapid charging of your AA batteries. Also, I doubt an AA battery would be capable of powering an electric bike. Now all we need to do is wind the remaining seven coils, solder them all together, and take this bike for a test ride. So the supercapacitors are fully charged. I'm wearing a helmet because the last time I rode this bike with a five kilogram spinning steel disc between my legs, apparently the irresponsible part was uh, the lack of helmet. So uh, safety first guys. Right, let's plug it in and give it a spin. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it works. <laughs> I don't know how much range I have, so I'm going to turn around because we are running this bike on capacitors after all. Power again. I can already tell it's running, <laughs> running very low. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> Still have a little bit of power left. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not great. <laughs> I reckon that's it. There we go. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so because this speed controller doesn't have regenerative braking capabilities, I need a way of charging these supercapacitors. So what I have here is my lithium ion electric bike battery, plugged it straight into my uh, lithium battery charger. And then from this, it's plugged into the supercapacitors down here. Now, obviously this charger isn't designed for charging supercapacitors, but if I pretend that I'm charging a nickel metal hydride or nickel metal uh, cadmium, I think it is, uh, I can pretend it's one of those batteries and it will ramp up the power here. This is one amp. This is the voltage of the capacitors. And stop. And that's how you charge your supercapacitor bike. <laughs> Going a bit further this time, just to see if um, we can make it back. And we've run out again. <laughs> Not great these capacitors, are they? What about if we, what about if I try and run it off of my actual electric bike battery? I wonder if that'll work. Okay, so because I don't have a mount on the bike for my battery, I've just uh, put it in a backpack and I've got this really long lead. It works, it actually, it runs off my uh, electric bike battery. Right, let's, um... this is all right, actually. Fully DIY e-bike, woohoo. <laughs> I can't believe this actually works. I know it's not got much power, but I feel, I, feel, I feel quite proud to actually say I've built my own e-bike from scratch, like fully from scratch. You know, like my other e-bikes are sort of modified motors to, to fit, but this,
This is an actual fully DIY e-bike. When I designed this motor controller, I made sure to use a board with a memory card option so we can enable data logging to analyze the tests. On the left is the voltage of the supercapacitors and on the right is the speed of the bike in meters per second. During acceleration, the voltage drops significantly and the bike only reaches a top speed of 3.5 meters per second before starting to decelerate as the max speed of the motor is determined by the input voltage. Then after just 99 meters, the motor shuts down due to lack of voltage and the bike rolls to a stop. But supercapacitors aren't designed for long range applications. They're designed for rapid charge and discharge situations. So I reprogrammed my other homemade electric bike to deal with the lower voltages and gave it a test. Similar to the previous tests, its speed is limited by the voltage of the capacitors. It just gets to that speed a lot quicker due to its 4 kilowatt motor. But the coolest thing about this bike is it has regenerative braking. So as I slow down to turn around, the voltage of the capacitors increase slightly, and I can use this power to accelerate out of the corner again. I was also able to charge the capacitors while cycling with the regen braking enabled, and then use this power to accelerate again. Though this isn't ideal, so I took the bike to the top of a hill and discharged it completely, before riding down the hill. The graph on the left shows the voltage of the capacitors, and the graph on the right shows the relative altitude of the hill as a percentage. Surprisingly, riding down this hill nearly fully charged the capacitors by the time I reached the bottom, and I was able to ride 41% of the distance back up the hill, which I think is very impressive. If the unpowered resistance of the motor was reduced, then this could be a very viable energy recovery system. On the topic of energy storage, I recently watched a documentary about the invention and evolution of lithium batteries over on Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is kind of like Netflix, but for nerds, which is way better as there's thousands of movies and TV shows that cover science, history, technology, and many more categories to choose from. Relating to my interests of engineering, energy storage, and aircraft, there is a great documentary that covers the transportation of the future, such as electric aircraft powered by lithium batteries and the engineering struggles behind them. Did you know to achieve the same energy storage of one kilogram of fossil fuel, you would need 25 kilograms of batteries? And considering how important weight is in an aircraft, it's a very interesting episode to watch. You can watch these on your mobile, computer browser, smart TV, and a range of other devices. If this interests you as much as it interested me, then you can sign up for just $14.99 for a whole year using the code Tom Stanton, or by clicking the link in the description down below. Thank you to all of my supporters over on patreon.com for making these kind of projects possible, and uh, thank you very much for watching this video. I guess I'll uh, see you in the next one. Goodbye.